Hello, we welcome you to the Bible study today. If you will, please open in your Bibles to Mark chapter 5, and let's begin. In Mark chapter 5, in verses 1 through 5, Mark writes these words. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. Let's look at this passage verse by verse. Verse 1, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. You remember earlier that Jesus taught on the Sea of Galilee. When evening had come, Jesus told his disciples in Mark 4 and 35, let us cross over to the other side, that is the other side of the sea, Sea of Galilee. Now we read how they came in a boat to the eastern side of the sea. Luke records in Luke 8 and 26, then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. The country or region was called the Gadarenes or the Gergesenes. Mark, along with Luke, called this country, or region, rather, the Gadarenes, Luke chapter 8 and 26. However, Mark identifies the region as the Gergesenes in Matthew 8 and 28. Either way is acceptable. They're referring to the same place. The difference may be to how each writer identified that particular region. It may be that Mark identified the region by the city of Gadara, while Matthew identified the same region by the city of Gerasa. Verse 2, And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. So when Jesus got out of the boat, immediately a man met him. This was an unhappy greeting. The man came to Jesus from the tombs, or these places of internment. We might think of a, a cemetery or a graveyard. Well, this man had an unclean spirit. This appears to be the dominant voice who spoke for the other unclean spirits or demons which possessed the, the man. He later identifies himself as legion. Why? Because they were many. Mark chapter 5 and 9. In Matthew's account, there were two demon-possessed men. He described how they were exceedingly fierce and how that no one could pass that way in Matthew 8 and 28. While Mark focuses on one of the men, that is the fiercer of the two men, we see that Matthew includes both. Luke also writes about this man as well. So Matthew, we see that Mark and Luke write about the fiercer of the two men. Luke chapter 8 and 27, And when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. So we gather some more information from Luke's account. One, that he had no clothes. And two, that he did not live in a house. He lived among the tombs. Verse 3, it says, Who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains. So the man dwelled among the tombs, or the sepulchers. People had bound the man with chains. However, no one could bind him anymore, not even with chains. Verse 4, Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. So we see from verse 4 that due to his great strength, no one could bind the man. When people bound him with shackles, he broke the shackles in pieces. And when people bound him with chains, he pulled the chains apart. 
No one was strong enough to tame him or to subdue the man. It says, and always, night and day, he was in the, in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. And so we learn here, verse 5, that the man wandered about the hills and the tombs. Constantly, the man was crying out. He was screaming. He was cutting himself with stones. And so we see a, a terrible scene of distress on the part of this man. Verses 6 to 7. Verses 6 to 7, Mark continues. He says, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. And so verse 6, we see how that this man saw Jesus from a distance. He ran and he worshipped him. It appears that the man recognized Jesus. However, even if he did not recognize Jesus from afar or from a distance, he did recognize him once he got closer. As we see, he fell down at his feet. And Mark says in Mark 5 and 6 that he worshipped him. And so we see how that he bowed down before Jesus. He fell down at his feet in front of him. The same word worshiped is used later in Mark 15, 19, where Mark uses the same term in reference to soldiers who at the crucifixion scene mockingly worshiped Jesus. So as they interrogated him prior to the crucifixion, we see they mocked him. They fell on their knees. They worshiped him. They mockingly did so. Verse 7, it says, And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Compare this event to when Jesus healed a man earlier, when he commanded an unclean spirit to come out of a man in a synagogue in Capernaum in Galilee. That was back in Mark 1, 23 to 26. The man cried out with a loud voice, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? The account of Matthew includes the question, Have you come to torment us before the time? Matthew 8 and 29. This is similar to the man at the synagogue in Capernaum with the unclean spirit who said, Did you come to destroy us? Mark 1 and 24. The unclean spirit knew about the judgment, but questioned Jesus as to what business he had with him since it was not yet the judgment. So what business do I have with you? What have I to do with you, Jesus, is what he said. So the unclean spirit implored or adjured Jesus by God not to torment him. The name the Most High God is a name used from ancient times. We see in the book of Genesis, for example, Genesis 14, 18, and is also quoted in the New Testament, Hebrews 7 and 1, where we see that Melchizedek, for instance, was said to be the priest of the Most High God. Now, there are several other examples in the, in the Bible, particularly the Old Testament. However, those are a couple examples. It's also noteworthy that a girl who was possessed with a spirit called Paul and his fellow workers the servant, ser servants of the Most High God in Acts 16, 16 to 18. Verses 8 to 10. Mark continues with his account, and he says, For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Verse 8, Jesus said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. So Jesus commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. In response, the spirit said, I implore you, 
by God that you do not torment me, Matthew or Mark 5 and verse 7, the one we just read. Luke's account reads in Luke 8 and 29, for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of him, out of the man. So that's the reason why he, he said this here, for he said to him. So he gives the explanation for what happened earlier when the man said, do not torment me. Verse 9, then he asked him, what is your name? So here we see Jesus asking the man with the unclean spirit his name. Jesus did not ask the man for the purpose of learning, but to establish his power. Oftentimes when the teacher asked questions, it's for the purpose of teaching. Certainly with Jesus, it was not to learn, but to teach. In this example, we see to teach the power of the Lord. The unclean spirit answered Jesus, my name is Legion. My name is Legion. Why? Well, he says, for we are many. So Mark records how that the reason why he was called Legion, or he called himself Legion, was because they were many. There were many demons which possessed the man. Uh, how many demons were there? Well, we don't know. The Bible doesn't say. However, if you look at Mark 5 and 13, you'll note that the demons, or these unclean spirits, may have numbered about 2,000, as there were about 2,000 pigs in the herd that we see later. And you'll understand better as we look at that passage in, in a moment. Verse 10, also he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. So the unclean spirit was begging Jesus as he was being cast out. First, the unclean spirit begged Jesus not to torment him, verse 7. He also begged Jesus that he would not send him out of the country, particularly the country, the Gadarenes, where he had possessed the man for a long time. Luke's account reads in Luke 8 and 32, and they begged him that he would not command them to go into the abyss. So not only to send him out of the country, but to send him to the abyss, perhaps referring to judgment, such as the bottomless pit referenced in the book of Revelation. Verses 11 to 13. Verses 11 to 13, Mark continues with the account. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Verse 11, he describes a large herd of swine feeding near the mountains. So this large herd of pigs feeding near the mountains or near the, here, near, near the hills. And so the place where the, the pigs were feeding was said to be on the mountain in Luke 8 and 32. And, and this was a good way off from there, as we see in Matthew 8 in verse 30. Verse 12, so all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. So the demons begged Jesus to send them to the swine so that they can enter them, so that they could enter into the, into the herd of, of the pigs. Why? Why did they want to go there? Well, the passage does not say. Verse 13, and at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. According to Mark, there were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So, regardless of the reason for the request, perhaps simply because they didn't want to go out of the country, we see that Jesus gave them permission. And so, as we see in Matthew 8 and 32, Jesus said, go. The demons, or these unclean spirits, went out of the man, and they entered into the herd of swine. The reason why I said perhaps there were about 2,000 demons in this man, well, that may be indicated as there were about 2,000 pigs here in the herd when the unclean spirits entered them and went into 
them and, and ran violently down this steep place into the sea. Ultimately, they perished in the water of the sea or, or the lake, the Sea of Galilee, Luke 8 and 33. Verses 14 to 17, Mark continues, he says, So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. Verse 14. Here we see how the herdsmen who fed the swine fled the scene, where they witnessed how the swine had ran violently down the steep place into the sea, drowned, perished. They told what they saw in the city and in the country. I wonder what the look was on their face when they told them. This may have been the city of Gadara that we mentioned earlier. This city is, long, uh, is not mentioned in the Bible. However, we do see the place of the Gadarenes mentioned here in this chapter. The people, after hearing the testimony of these men, these herdsmen, went to the place where the swine perished. Verse 15, the people came to Jesus. They saw the one who had been demon-possessed. Remember, the one who had been possessed had been possessed for a long time. Now, he was no longer fierce, but sitting, apparently peacefully. The one who had no clothes was now clothed, Luke 8 and 27. The man who was out of his mind, was now in his right mind. Seeing the change in the man, the people were afraid. Some of these people probably had, uh, might have had a hand in trying to bind the man for his safety as well as safety of others. However, they were unsuccessful. Well, some of them no doubt were aware of this man and what he had done. And so they were afraid. They saw the great change in this man. How could this possibly have happened? None of them were able to help him. Verse 16. Those who fed the swine told the people what had happened to him. They told them by what means he who was demon-possessed was healed, according to Luke 8 and 36. And the answer to the means of the great change in the life of this man was none other than the name Jesus. So Jesus was the answer. The herdsmen also told the people about the swine. They told them how the swine ran into the sea and drowned. Verse 17, the people responded by pleading with Jesus to depart from their region, the region of the Gadarenes. According to Luke's account, the reason they asked him to depart from them was that they were, quote, seized with great fear, Luke 8 and 37. Makes sense, as we saw earlier here in Mark, that they were afraid. And now we see how they pled with Jesus not to stay, but to depart from their region. Verse 18 to 20. Mark continues with the passage. He says, And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. So, verse 18, we see how that Jesus answered their plea to depart from them, and he got into the boat, and he was getting ready to leave. 
when Jesus got into the boat, the man who he healed begged him that he could be with him. A touching scene to, to consider. Uh, here's a man who had been through terrible distress and things that he suffered, and now finally, relief. Clothed in his right mind, simply wanting to be with Jesus, to accompany Jesus as he crossed back over the Sea of Galilee to the western side of the sea. It's understandable that the man wanted to go with him to accompany him, given that Jesus had cast out the demons at once possessed him. Jesus did something for the man that no one else could do. And so we certainly could see the reason that he wanted to be with Jesus. Verse 19, however, Jesus did not permit him to go with him. Why not? Well, he told him, go home to your friends. Perhaps these friends included people who tried to help the man, but were unable. He said in Luke 8 and 39, return to your own house. This is the man who dwelt among the tombs, now being told to go home to his own house. The reason that Jesus did not allow him to be with him or to accompany him was that the people in that region needed to hear the great things that the Lord had done for him. If Jesus was going to lead, leave the place as requested by these people, certainly someone had to stay. Someone had to remain and tell the story, tell them what great things the Lord had done for the man. Jesus wanted the man to tell the people of the Gadarenes of the power and the compassion of the Lord. In Luke's account, he called the Lord God in Luke 8 and 39. Again, it's no, there's no confusion what the writers of the, of the gospel accounts thought of Jesus. He was not simply a man. He was, he was the son of God. Matthew chapter 5, Mark chapter 5 and verse 20, we see how he departed. Jesus said to the man who he healed, tell them what great things the Lord has done for you, Mark 5 and 19. And so the man did as he requested, as he had told him. He departed from his home and he began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had told him. Note how the man equated the Lord with Jesus. It says, and he went his way, this is in Luke 8 and 39, and he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Well, as a result of the proclamation of the man, we see that many heard of the power and of the compassion of the, of the Lord. And as a result, we see in verse 20, all marveled, all, all marveled. It's something how that the people who came to the scene at first feared Jesus, and now we see the people marveling as they were amazed hearing what great compassion and power the Lord Jesus, God, had shown to this man. And back across the sea, Jesus went, back to Galilee. Verse 21 to 24. Mark continues, he says, in verse 21, Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Verse 21, Jesus crossed back over the Sea of Galilee. This was not far from Capernaum, according to Mark 2, 1, and also in verse 13. As there was a great multitude standing before Jesus prior to his departure, 
across the sea. Now there was a multitude who gathered him again by the sea. Mark 4 and 36, according to Luke 8 and 40, Luke records, so it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. How long was Jesus on the other side of the Sea of Galilee? How long was he in the country of the, of the Gergesenes or the, uh, as we see there? What, how long was he there? Well, we're not told. Uh, the miracle itself did not appear to take uh, long. However, however long it was, we see the people were waiting for him. And so uh, that, that says something, right? Consider that all these people are, are waiting for Jesus to return. It's, it's nighttime. It was nighttime when he, he was uh, crossing the sea and he came to that place on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And later on, he returns and the people are still there waiting. Verse 22. We see earlier that Jesus entered the synagogue and healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. You might remember that from our earlier study in Mark 3, 1 to 6. Those who were there watched Jesus so that they might accuse him. Accuse him of what? Accuse him of healing someone on the Sabbath and, according to them, breaking the Sabbath. Well, we talked about that earlier. Mark now calls attention to how a ruler of the synagogue came to Jesus. And so this man's name was Jairus. And so when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. And so one of the rulers of the synagogue, and so probably talking about the, the synagogue here of Capernaum, the same synagogue that he was at where he healed the man with a withered hand. And now one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, comes to him and falls at his feet. Verse 23. Jairus, on his knees, begged Jesus to come to his house and lay his hands on his little daughter, who was near death. By so doing, we see that he recognized the power of Jesus. He was not trying to find something to accuse Jesus of, as did the Pharisees mentioned earlier. He simply wanted the power and compassion of the Lord to heal his daughter so that she would live. What was the condition of Jairus' daughter? According to Mark, the man said that she lies at the point of death. According to Matthew, the man said that she had just died in Matthew 9 and verse 18. These two passages in Mark and Matthew are both describing the same condition, the condition of death. She was, she was there. She was dying. She's at the point of death, and she died. Luke, the physician, wrote she was dying in Luke 8 and 42. Yet notice how the man believed that if Jesus lays his hands on her, she will live. So she's at the point of death. She's dying and perhaps already dead, as we see mentioned. This point would be, would be different, difficult to distinguish. Ultimately describing the same condition, death. And while she died, we see that the man believed that if Jesus laid his hands on her, she would, would live. And so demonstrating his, his faith in the power of Jesus. Verse 24, so Jesus went with him. That's what he, he pleaded. He pleaded for Jesus to come with him and lay his hands on his daughter so that his daughter would live. So Jesus went with Jairus to do as he asked him to do. As they went, a great multitude followed Jesus and thronged him. They pressed upon him. Of course, this would delay him from coming to the house. According to Luke in Luke 8 and 42, the little daughter of Jairus was his only daughter, and she was about 12 years of age. 
again, consider the, the sincerity and the earnestness of the man's request. This is my only daughter. She's only 12 years old. Uh, she's, she's at the point of death. She's dying. Uh, or according to Matthew, she has died. And, and now he's asking for compassion and power of the Lord to heal her so that she will live. And so Jesus is proceeding to follow him. However, the multitude throngs him, presses upon him. In verses 25 to 34, we see how Jesus healed a, healed a woman along the way. And so Jesus is having opportunity after another to demonstrate his power and to confirm that the gospel that he's preaching is the gospel of the kingdom of God. Verse 25 to 28. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, we see the results following in verse 29. Let's look at verse 25. And so according to the passage, we see that the woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. What exactly was her condition? Well, all we know is what we see here. And what we see here is what we also see in Matthew and Luke. Uh, some versions may read hemorrhage. However, basically, we see that she was bleeding for some reason. This was her condition. Matthew 9, 20, and also Luke 8 and 43. Verse 26, we see how that the woman continued to be subject to bleeding despite being treated by physicians. Mark noted how that she suffered many things from many physicians. And so in an attempt to be made well, she spent all that she had, and, the, and, and, and something sad was that even despite all her, of the money and all the resources spent on physicians, she still had the condition. And not only that, she grew worse. She was getting worse. She had this flow of blood for 12 years. And now, despite all that, the efforts of the, of the doctors, and the money spent, she was no better. In fact, she grew worse. 27, when she heard about Jesus, she had exhausted her possibilities for, for well-being, for healing. But she heard about Jesus. And so the, word, the woman heard about him and how he healed the sick. And so she came behind Jesus in the crowd and touched the hem or the border of his garment, with the hope of being healed. Mark 3 and 10, Mark writes, For he healed many, so that many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. Now this is earlier in Mark 3 in verse 10. Also later in Mark 6 and 56, Whenever he entered, wherever he entered, into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. And so we see that the case here with the woman is, is not the only case that would happen during the ministry of Jesus. Verse 28, she had heard that Jesus healed, touched and healed other people. Others who had afflictions pressed about to touch Jesus too, Mark 3.10. And despite her, the past failures with physicians, she still had faith. She had faith that if she could only touch the clothes of Jesus, that she would be made well. According to Matthew, she said to herself in Matthew 9 and 21, if only I may touch his garment, I may be made well. So she's saying this to herself. At least she thought she was saying this to herself. Ultimately, someone heard Jesus. Verse 29, 
immediately her bleeding stopped. She had suffered from, from this affliction for years. Now she could feel that something had changed. She was healed of her affliction. Verse 30, Jesus asked, who touched my clothes? This was a curious question. There were people from the crowd from all around Jesus, pressing about him. I suppose there were a lot of people touching Jesus. How could the touch of one person be distinguished from the touch of others? Verse 31, the disciples were confused. His disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? And so the disciples were confused. Why? Well, that's obvious. There were people from the crowd all around Jesus pressing about him. How could the touch, again, how could the touch of one person be distinguished from the touch of the others in this multitude or in this crowd which thronged him, which pressed about him? And you say, who touched me? Verse 32, and he looked around to see her who had done this thing. Note that he already knew who touched, touched, her, touched him. So Jesus looked around to see the woman, not the person, to see the woman who had touched his clothes. While there were many people around him, pressing about him, he already knew who touched his clothes from among the multitude. Verse 33, but the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. It sounds as though she's in trouble, but she was not in trouble. Once the woman recognized that Jesus knew that it was she who touched his clothes, she was afraid and trembled. She knew that she had been healed. She came and fell down before Jesus and told him, told him the truth of what had happened. Note that the miracle did not remain a secret, but became a public demonstration of the power and compassion of the Lord. Luke 8 and 47, Luke records, Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she had or how she was healed immediately. So she begins to testify about how she was healed immediately. And she did this before all the crowd, the multitude who was there. It's significant that this happened after she was healed. She had suffered a lot. She'd suffered many years and now she's finally well. Not only do we see the power of Jesus, but we also see his compassion. She was not in trouble. Verse 34, Jesus was not angry with her. In fact, Jesus commended her faith. However, it was not the touching of his clothes that healed the woman, but Jesus. She would be and would continue to be well and free from this affliction. Jesus said in Matthew 9 and 22, the woman, be of good cheer, daughter, your faith has made you well. Think of all those who witnessed the healing of the woman. There was the multitude, which included the disciples of Jesus, along with Jairus, who Jesus was following to his house, who had asked Jesus to come to his home to heal his daughter. Imagine, perhaps Jairus thought, is my daughter next? In verses 35 to 43, we see Jesus visiting the house of Jairus' family. Mark 5 and 35, while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? That sounds pretty harsh. While Jesus was still speaking to the woman, some came from the house of Jairus. Remember, Jairus was one of the rulers of the synagogue. Mark 5 and 22. One, one said to Jairus, rather callously, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any 
further. Verse 36 to 39, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. So as soon as Jesus heard what the man said to Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, he told him, do not be afraid, only believe. According to Luke's account, Jesus also said, she will be made well. So basically, disregard what that man had said. The one who came to him said, your daughter is dead already. Don't trouble him any, any further. Rather, Jesus said, do not be afraid. What might the man have to fear? Well, think about it. He came to Jesus when his daughter, his only daughter, was at the point of death. He was being delayed by the crowd. And now someone from his house came and told him that his daughter was dead and to give up hope. Don't trouble him any further. As though he wanted him to, to be in despair. Verse 37, Jesus, it says, and he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they finally did get to the house, we see that Jesus permitted no one to follow him into the house except for his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John. These disciples were seen together on other occasions as well, such as at the transfiguration in Mark 9 and 2, and also the prayer in the garden in Mark 14 and 33. The only others who were permitted by Jesus to enter into the house were the father and the mother of the girl, like we see in Luke 8 and 51. Verse 38, then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. So at the house of Jairus, there was a tumult. That is, they raised a commotion. You can imagine people milling about, uh, crying. The mourning proceeded even before the father had opportunity to come to the house. He didn't even, he had not even arrived at the house yet and they were already having the service, the funeral service. They were already mourning. Verse 39, when he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. You remember in the case of Lazarus, how Jesus spoke of death as sleep. Well, when Jesus came in, that is into the house of Jairus, he said to them, to the people who were there making the tumult. Why make this commotion and weep? The child, that is the little daughter, the 12 year old girl is not dead, but sleeping. Verse 40, and they ridiculed him. It says, but when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. So when Jesus came into the house, he asked them why they were making this commotion and weeping. And the people ridiculed Jesus. They scorned him. They mocked him. However, Jesus put them all outside. Jesus took the father and the mother of the child along with Peter, James, and John entered where the child was lying inside the house. And the scorners, those who ridiculed Jesus, were put out and they missed out on a miracle that few were permitted to see that day. Verse 41, then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kuma, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. According to Luke 8 and 55, we see, then her spirit returned and she arose immediately. Jesus took the child by the hand who was lying in the house. He said to her, little girl, arise took her by the hand, 
and she arose. These words are the words that Mark translates into Greek for those who did not know Aramaic. And so we see that Jesus speaking in Aramaic and, and here we have Mark translating into Greek, which of course we have here in, in English. Little girl, arise. So the girl who was dead, and she was dead, arose and walked. Those who witnessed the miracle were overcome with great amazement, as you might imagine. None more so were astonished than her mother and her father. Luke 8 and 56. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. It's interesting that the girl that Jesus restored to life was the same age as the years the woman had the issue of blood that Jesus healed earlier. Why? Why the why this the similarity between the two instances? We're not told. However, it is it is interesting. Verse 43. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, and said that something should be given her to eat. Jesus commanded those privileged to see the miracle inside the house to tell no one outside what had happened. That is, as far as the resurrection of the girl. After all, remember earlier that Jesus told those who caused the commotion, raised the tumult, who ridiculed and scorn Jesus. He said the child is not dead but sleeping in Mark 5 and 39. And so Jesus also said that they should give her something to eat. You know, after all, she just woke up, right? You, you think about somebody that has slept and they wake up, maybe perhaps eating something for breakfast. But in this case here, we see that, yes, she had died. Jesus referred to her as sleeping. Of course, she, she had died. But for Jesus, with his power, she might as well just have been sleeping as he took her by the hand and, and told her to arise, and she arose as easily as somebody might wake up from sleeping. Jesus had the power. So we see this great demonstration of the compassion and the power of Jesus. Of course, the scorners didn't get to see uh, when Jesus said she's not dead and sleeping, maybe that caused some confusion in their minds, minds of the scorners, the ridiculers. But after all, we see that we see that uh, he said something should be given her to eat. So give her something to eat. Well, of course, there's no way that that uh, news of this would be would be kept secret for long. But uh, here in verse 43, he did command. He commanded them that they should tell no one, that it should not be made known. Now, uh, Jesus did this at different times during his ministry for different reasons. For example, we've already noted in Mark one example when Jesus told them not to tell, the reason being that he would not be able to enter the city as easily as he would otherwise. So uh, that may be a... Uh, uh, reason in this case as well. Uh, someone has suggested perhaps that he told them to tell no one at least until he had made his way free of the of the crowd, you know, went on his way. At least get clear of the area of the crowd before before the parents start telling everybody that uh, they that Jesus healed their daughter, raised her, raised their daughter to life. So again, there's no way to prevent the news from ultimately being known. And Jesus had, after all, just broken up a funeral. And what he said about the girl sleeping may have, like I said, confused the scorners enough. And perhaps they would conceal the matter until Jesus uh, went on his way. Matthew 9 and 26. And the report of this went into all the land 
a person has to smile as you read this. Uh, of course, you know that the words are going to get out. Could you imagine being the parents and not being able to tell others about your daughter who had been raised from the dead? Your daughter who had died, been brought back to life? Amazing. Wonderful to consider. The opportunity that, that some of these people had to witness the power and the compassion of Jesus and the miracles that he shown. We've, we've seen a lot here in this chapter. We hope that you've learned uh, from our study. We know that there is so much more that can be learned and that can be meditated upon, but we encourage you to do that in your own time. Our time has expired, so we leave the lesson with you today, and we hope that you have a wonderful day, wonderful night. Thank you for being here, and we hope that you'll be able to come again, uh, visit again our program. Thank you.